Good morning, congregation, and uh, all of those who are in the listening audience of Pioneer Drive Baptist Church worship service this morning. What a joy it is to be back in the pulpit at Pioneer Drive. I had the opportunity at the beginning of the month to preach a little bit, teach a little bit over in Israel, but uh, there's nothing like being in this pulpit and being with you. I wish I could see your beautiful, smiling faces. Um, that day's coming. It's going to be a while. We don't know when, but we believe and we hope that it'll be soon. I want to say a special word of thank you to our young people who have led us beautifully in the musical part of worship today. I'm grateful to Eric uh, McElhaney for leading us in that directed time of prayer. We need to be on our knees before the Father now, perhaps like never before in uh, recent history. And it's good to have that prayer time. If you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to open them to what many believe to be the oldest book of the Bible, and that's the book of Job in the Old Testament. Uh, if you open your Bible to the very middle, you'll probably be in the book of Psalms. Job comes right before the book of Psalms. And normally on a Sunday morning when we read Scripture, we all stand in honor of the reading of Scripture. And that may not be possible for you where you are today. But if it is, let's stand together and let's follow along as I read from Job, the first chapter. Verse 1 says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 300 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men in the east. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in all the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse thee to thy face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. May God add his richest blessings to, to this, the reading of his word, and may his Holy Spirit apply the teaching and the preaching of his word to our hearts and to our lives this day. There's nothing that shakes our lives like unjust suffering, senseless suffering. A little child darts out into the street and is struck by an automobile. A, a church bus is swept off the road by flood waters and Ten young people lose their lives. An underwater earthquake occurs and, and creates a tsunami that kills tens of thousands of people on two, two different continents. Or our world is struck with a virus that seems to attack the most vulnerable of our population, and it's worldwide. It's a pandemic. Now, these are the headlines of our newspapers. These are the stories we hear. These are the things that make up our prayer requests. We'd like to think that life is fair and that life is just. But all too often, we have seen the wrong people get sick. We have seen the wrong people lose their jobs. We've seen the wrong people die young. And we want to ask the question, why, Lord? Why them? Why us? Why me? Why do the worst of things seem to happen to the best people? Well, the book of Job wrestles with that question. As I said earlier, some think the book of Job is the oldest book of the Bible. And if that's the case, I think it's fitting that in the oldest part of the book, this old question of man is dealt with. Why do the worst things happen to the best people? Now, the book of Job is a real-life story, but it begins like a fairy tale. It introduces us to the wealthiest, godliest, most respected man of the East. He is surrounded by all of those things that people normally think would be signs or tokens of God's divine favor. He has a large family. 
He has vast wealth, uh, vigorous health, and a great reputation. It, it appears as though every cloud in Job's life, in Job's sky, has a silver lining. But it isn't long before dark clouds begin to form. And suddenly Job loses everything but his faith. He is plunged into such depths of despair and heartache that he wonders where God is. His wife and some of his friends come and they offer quick and easy answers to these complex questions. They try to help, but actually they do a great deal of harm. In all of this, Job's faith bends, but it doesn't break. And in the end, God vindicates the faith of this good man. The book of Job ends as it begins with Job blessed and with Job happy. But in between the beginning and ending, he is left to struggle with life's most distressing question, why do the worst things happen to the best of people? Well, there are five scenes in the book of Job, and scene one opens on earth, where Job is introduced as a clean living, highly successful businessman. After a very brief introduction, the scene shifts from earth up to heaven, and Satan is appearing before God. Now, God asks Satan a question. He says, have you considered my servant Job? That word considered literally means, have you set your heart on Job? God obviously is reading Satan's mind. He knows that Satan would like to get at this good man. You see, Job is such a good man and his reputation is so widespread that if Satan could, stri uh, could trip him up, if, if Satan could destroy his faith, the, the tremors would be felt around the world. And God knows that. And so he asked Satan, are you, are you setting your heart on my servant, Job? I don't know what you believe about Satan. The Bible presents him as a real person. Not just a power, not just a force in our world, but a real person. The name Satan means adversary. So he is presented in the Bible as one who is against God, one who is against man. He's opposed to God and everything that God stands for. Uh, Jesus tells us that Satan is out to kill and to steal and to destroy. And Simon Peter described him as a, as a roaring lion prowling about seeking whom he might devour. Satan has set his heart on Job, knowing that if he can destroy Job's faith, the repercussions would be felt everywhere. You need to remember this. The more you mean to God, the more you mean to Satan. Well, he couldn't find anything wrong with the character of Job, so he begins to attack the motives of Job. Satan says to God, God, you, you built a hedge around around Job. You have protected him and you have, have blessed him tremendously with all these good things. If that hedge were taken away and he lost all of these good things, I could get to him and his faith would crumble and fall. Now God knows that the faith of, of, of Job is real, but Satan doesn't know that and Job doesn't know that and Job's wife and friends don't know that. No man knows the quality of his faith until that faith is tested. And so God grants Satan permission to test Job, and the scene changes a third time from heaven back to earth again, and all of a sudden, tragedy strikes Job. Rustlers come, and they take off with most of his cattle. A storm comes, and lightning strikes and kills the rest of his livestock. His children are celebrating in a house, and a cyclone comes, and all ten of his children are killed. And suddenly this man Job is as bereft as a person can be. But in all of this, the Bible tells us that Job did not sin, nor did he curse God or blame God. He rather worshiped God and he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now that was not the response that Satan wanted. He wanted Job to curse God. He wanted Job to become bitter and angry and doubting toward God. And that would affect a lot of other people. Job rather worshiped and he blessed the name of God. Well, the scene shifts a fourth time back from earth to heaven. And Satan this time says to God, you know, Job still has his health. 
Oh, he's lost a lot of things. He's lost his children. He's lost his, his wealth, but he still has vigorous health. And as long as he does, he's going to serve me. But if you would let me touch him at that point and take away his health, it will prove that his faith is insincere. And once again, God grants Satan permission to, chest, to test Job. And so the scene shifts a fifth time from heaven back to earth again. And all of a sudden, Job's body is covered with these hideous sores. In excruciating pain, he goes out to the city dump and he sits down in the ashes and begins to scrape his body, trying to get rid of those sores, trying to get some relief. It is a pitiful picture. The city dump is a place of discarded things. And here this great man is once again sitting in the place of discarded things. He's grieving. He is destitute. His wealth is gone. His children are dead. His body is racked with pain. Job has lost everything except his faith in God. Now, let me stop here for just a moment to point out two or three things in the story thus far that we must not miss. The first thing is this. It was not God who caused Job's problems. It was Satan. Now, to be sure, God permitted it and above Every experience that we have in life, there, there must be written those words permitted. But there's a great difference between God causing something and God permitting something. It was not God who stole Job's cattle. It was not God who sent that cyclone that killed his children. And it was not God that sent the disease to his body. It was Satan. And Satan has done such a tremendous snow job on our world. He is the cause of most of our problems. And yet he's so clever, he's so cunning that God gets the blame. Second thing I want you to note about this story is that all of this happened to Job, not because he was bad, but because he was good. It didn't happen because Job lacked faith. It happened because Job had faith and Satan was out to destroy it. Now, you'll find some well-meaning folks today who will say to you in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of your suffering, that this is happening to you because you don't have faith or you don't have enough faith. If you just had enough faith, you would be well. Or if you just had enough faith, these troubles would go away. Let me remind you, it happened to Job because he did have faith. If you ask the question, what has Job done to deserve all this? The answer is simple. He's done nothing. He's done nothing. You read those first two chapters and you discover that Job is God's very best man. It's not because he's bad. It's because he is good. And then the third truth that I want you to remember in the story thus far is that Job never knows. He never knows why this is happening. You see, he's not able to see what's taking place behind the scenes in heaven. He doesn't know what's been going on between God and Satan. He hasn't been priv privy to these conversations between God and the adversary. Job doesn't have the book of Job to read like you and I do. All he has is the struggle that he's involved in. And all he knows is his wealth is gone, his children are dead, and his body is racked and wrecked by pain. Now, in this experience, Job goes through almost every emotion known to man. There is fear, there is anger, there is depression, and there is doubt. He even wants to die. And at one point, he says, it would have been better had I never been born. Or since I was born, it would have been great if I had just died at birth. But since I was born and didn't die at birth, I think it would be great if I could just die now, in all of this, his wife comes to him and she says, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Now, remember, she suffered a great deal as well. She's lost her children as well, but her faith cannot stand the strain. And she knows that Job has been a good man. She knows that he doesn't deserve these awful things. And she says, Job, you've been true to God, but God hasn't been true to you. And you can't change your circumstances, but at least you can have the last word. Why don't you just curse God and die? And that just added to Job's problems. He's lost his health, his wealth, his children, and now he's lost the support, the emotional support 
of his wife. The one person he needed beside him to help him and encourage him is saying, curse God and die. Now, Job is wiser than his wife, and he knows God better than she does. And so he just suffers in silence. In time, three of Job's friends come to him, Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad. And Job has been numbed to silence. Suffering will do that to us at times. These three friends come and they sit down with Job. And for seven days and seven nights, they sit there in silence. They say nothing. It's probably the best thing they could have done. When you go to offer comfort to someone and you don't know what to say, it's best just to say nothing and just be there. In time, Job begins to complain about his circumstances to these three friends. And when Job starts to complain, they start to explain. They start trying to tell Job why all this has happened to him. And they give him the oldest, commonest explanation for suffering. They say, Job, all this is happening because of your sin. Job, you've done something wrong and God is punishing you for this. Now, they start at different points, but they all wind up at the same place, and they say, whoever perished being innocent. Job, it's because of your sin. Now, Job's not perfect, and he knows that, but he also knows that he hasn't done anything so bad that warrants this kind of punishment. After all, you don't cure dandruff with a guillotine, and you don't get rid of termites by burning your house down. And he was suffering too much for any one sin he may have committed. And a great deal of the book of Job is the dialogue between Job and these friends who are trying to convince him, trying to convince him that he is an awesome sinner while Job maintains his innocence before God. When they have finally exhausted their arguments, a fourth friend arrives. He is a young intellectual named Elihu. And Elihu's explanation is that there is creative, uh, creating a uh, creative purpose in suffering and value in suffering. Just think, he says, how this is refining you. Just think how this is making you a better, more wonderful person. Job is in no frame of mind to think about being refined at this point. So he enters into a dialogue with this young man and it goes on for a great while. I want you to remember this. The arguments put forth for suffering in the book of Job are not God's arguments. They are God's record of man's argument. Did you get that? The arguments in the book of Job are not God's arguments. They are man's argument, and man's arguments are wrong. In fact, if you want to get God's assessment of these arguments, you need to read Job chapter 42, verse 7 where God says to the friends of Job, my wrath is kindled against you because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. What those friends said to Job was wrong. What Job was saying was right. Now it's not until the 38th chapter of this book that God comes to Job. He finally appears and he catches Job up on this whirlwind and takes him on a mental tour of the universe. He, he shows him the constellations of the heavens and all the creatures of the animal kingdom. And in that tour of the universe, God asks Job a series of 65 questions that Job cannot answer. And being stumped by these questions, Job comes to realize that if man cannot understand the uh, created universe and the physical universe, how can he hope to understand the moral universe? universe. If he cannot understand about all the constellations and all the creatures of God's creation, how can he comprehend the mind of God in these deep things? And he's overwhelmed by it. It's beyond him. And so Job, awed to silence, humbles himself before God. Now throughout the book of Job, God never answers Job's question. And if you're, if you're waiting for an answer, I'm sorry, it's, it's not coming. God never answers the question of Job's mind, but he does meet the need of Job's heart. You see, he doesn't give Job an answer. What he does is he gives himself to Job 
as the answer. His presence, his power, his counsel, his hope. And in reality, that's what Job really needed. He didn't need an explanation from God. He needed an experience with God. And once Job came to recognize the wisdom of God and the power of God and the the, the genuine experience that he had with God, oddly enough, his questions didn't seem to matter as much. Part of the message of the book of Job is just that. It is that God does not owe us an explanation for life. And we're probably not going to get one from him. And if we're going to not just survive during these days, But if we're going to thrive in this world, then we must learn to trust God even when we don't know why things are happening as they are. We have to anchor ourselves to an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God even when there are no answers to why bad things happen to good people or why bad things happen to God's people. And because Job trusted God and kept hanging on to faith in God, in the end, God restored to Job all that he had lost. Now the experience of Job teaches us how to cope with trials and tribulation and suffering and difficulties. In fact, the book gives us four ways to cope and three of them are wrong. If you're taking notes, as I would encourage you to do very briefly, I'm going to share these four ways of coping with life with you. The first is simply this. You can choose, if you want to, to grope your way through life by asking the question every day, why me? Lord, why me? Or why us? Why this? Why now? Why is all of this happening? We need to understand that God seldom, if ever, answers the why question. You see, the question of why is not so much a request for information as it is a cry for help. What we really want is a change in our circumstances. What we really want is someone to come and help us through this difficult time, this time of suffering. And the why question wouldn't do that. And like Job, we have to live this life in a certain degree of uncertainty as to what's going on behind the scenes. But you can, if you so choose, Grope your way through life. You can sit down and say, you know what? I am not moving from this point until I know why all of this is happening. And if that's your choice, then I'm afraid life is going to pass you by. But you can choose, if you want to, to grope your way through life. Or secondly, you can choose to mope your way through life. That is, you can fill your life with self-pity. And instead of saying, Lord, why me? You say, Lord, woe is me. And if you you give yourself to self-pity, always moping in life, in the end you'll wind up worse than you were in the beginning. I'll tell you, self-pity is easily the most destructive, non-pharmaceutical narcotic there is in life. Paul Powell, my good friend who is now with the Lord, told of a, a friend of his who was in an industrial accident and lost his leg and had been hobbling on a wooden leg for some 30 years. And his friend's testimony was and is, if you're ever crippled by some injury or illness, you must focus every day on what you can do, not on what you can't do. You must focus on what you have, not on what you have lost. But you may, if you choose, mope your way through life by focusing on what you can't do. You can grope your way, you can mope your way, or... You could dope your way through life. You can pop a pill. You can smoke a joint. You can snort some powder. You can take a drink, mainline a drug. To the secularist, the single most popular way to cope with problems in life is some kind of drug, most prominently alcohol. I came across a piece that is often used by members of Alcoholics Anonymous. It says, we drank for happiness and became unhappy. We drank for joy and became miserable. We drank for sociability and became argumentative. We drank for sleep and woke up without rest. We drank medicinally and acquired health problems. We drank for relaxation 
and got the tremors. We drank for confidence and became doubtful. We drank to forget and were forever haunted. We drank for freedom but became slaves. We drank to erase problems and we saw our problems multiply. We drank to cope with life, yet we invited death. We drank to feel heavenly and ended up feeling like hell. Be careful about doping your way through life. If it will dry the tear, it will also dull the joy. But we can choose to dope our way or to mope our way or to grope our way through life. The best way is to hope your way through. And that's how Job dealt with his suffering. That's what got him through. Job went through terrible times. He experienced great pain, outrage, and despair. In fact, there are times, if you read the book carefully, when Job skirted on the very edge of blasphemy against God. Yet, well, while Job never gave up, well, actually, he almost did give up on the justice of God. I think there are times when he did give up on the justice of God. He never gave up on God himself. And the greatest affirmation of faith in the book of Job, one of the greatest affirmations of faith in all the word of God is found in that 13th chapter and the 15th verse where Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. New American Standard says, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. No answer came from heaven. Job cried out to God, and it were as though heaven was made of steel. And God never told him why. But Job clung to hope. He said, even though he slay me, yet will I hope, yet will I trust in him. And while God seldom tells us why we suffer, why we go through these times of tribulation and testing. He does give us hope that in his presence, he will enable us to go through these experiences and eventually emerge victorious. You know, we don't understand suffering and testing any better than Job. But we do have far more reason to hope than Job ever did. And the reason is that God himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, has become a partaker in suffering with us. The holy God suffered at the hands of unholy men at Calvary's cross. And knowing what happened to Jesus as a result of that suffering, knowing how God highly exalted him on resurrection day, on Easter Sunday, we have to believe that even in our suffering, Even in the midst of our uncertainties, there is some good that God can and will produce from it, though we may never know it completely in this life. We see now through a glass darkly. We only know in part today, but one day will come when we will know fully, even as we are fully known. Whatever may come to us by that permissive hand of God, we can endure by the grace of God. Because of the Lord Jesus, we can say along with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. In our suffering, let us cling to the cross of Jesus Christ, the one who suffered for us and the one whom God has raised high above the created universe. Jesus, the Christ, the Lord of all. Church family and those who are listening today, I know that you're hurting. We are all hurting. Some of you are in a hospital room or you're at home in your bedroom and you're hurting physically. Some of you are going through financial difficulty. Some of you this morning are hurting relationally. Maybe there is distance between you and your spouse or your children or your parents or the people that are closest to you. I know that I'm speaking today to an audience filled with hurting people. I'm hurting. We all are. Would we learn from Job today? 
would we understand that this suffering does not come from God? That this suffering is not necessarily due to your sin or to my sin. And we may never understand why. But through it all, hang on to hope. Cling to hope. God will see you through. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today. We recognize that you are the giver of every good and every perfect gift, and you're the author of everlasting life. We come into your presence needing not so much explanations, but needing, crying out for a fresh experience with you. Help us to cling to hope. Help us to trust in your goodness and in your grace. Lord, thank you for your promise that you will not leave us and you will never turn your back on us. Though we walk through the fire, we will not be scorched. You are our deliverer. And our hope, our trust is completely in you. This is our prayer. This is our word of praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen.